Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. Thank you all for joining us today. We will start with our morning prayer. I'm reading from pages 154 and 155, just excerpts from Mary Baker Eddy's letter to the First Church of Christ Scientist in Lawrence. He says, it is the purpose of divine love to resurrect the understanding and the kingdom of God, the reign of harmony already within us. The pride of circumstance or power is the prince of this world that has nothing in Christ. All power and happiness are spiritual and proceed from goodness. Sacrifice self to bless one another, even as God has blessed you. Forget self in laboring for mankind. Then will you woo the weary wanderer to your door, win the pilgrim and stranger to your church, and find access to the heart of humanity. While pressing meekly on, be faithful, be valiant in the Christian's warfare, and peace will crown your joy. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you very much. All right, um, the watching point. Watch number 143. <clears throat> Watch lest you believe that the spiritual idea, which is the real nature of man, can be lost, contaminated, or rendered inoperative because of any human condition, happening, or evidence. In Matthew 4, 7, Jesus says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If the Lord is God transformed into idea or man, then our task is to realize that this Christ nature in ourselves or others cannot be lost, that it cannot be defiled or even tempted by any earthly suggestions or conditions. When you are tempted to feel sick or to sin, you can realize that man's real nature is superior to such phases of the dream of mortality. Once a woman had an internal displacement. She was a Christian scientist, but she was greatly tempted to submit to an operation because it seemed the only way to get relief. She started for her practitioner's office in order to tell her what she planned to do. But on the way, she became so grateful for Christian science that she determined to live, to live up to its teachings to the best of her ability, even if she were never healed of the physical disorder. That's from a Christian Science Sentinel, August 15, 1931. This lady experienced her healing right then and there. Her declaration was really a determination to defend her recognition of the fact that she was a spiritual idea and reflected God against being belittled or interfered with by any false testimony or human suggestion. Do not tempt the Lord thy God. Do not believe that man's spiritual selfhood which is the expression of God's being, is susceptible to being tempted. Thank you. <clears throat> Comments on that? Well, I feel well, that's... A, I was, go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead. A good answer yeah, yeah. to the thoughts that people get that they've, like, wasted their potential or they're beyond help or... You know, like to to the claims that we can just leave people behind and they're not worth it. <laughs> everyone is everyone is worth it. Everyone, the core of everyone is a God's good idea, and it can be reclaimed. So. That's beautiful. Very good explanation. Thank you. 
Karen? Well, I was just going to say the the, um, the the where it says this lady experienced her healing right then and there. Her de- declaration was really a determination to defend her recognition of the fact that she was a spiritual idea reflecting God, and that's that's been very helpful to me because I I um I am as I'm learning that standing up for that and and recognizing it and and claiming it i i um i cannot be tempted to come down from there or to think that it's not that's not uh, true in any way even though evidence may say differently that um i i can't be tempted to be, be belittled or interfered with thank you yes it it raises you up above the mortal belief of things. Anyone else? Well, I always thought that that tempt, you know, do not tempt, meant that we weren't supposed to, you know, like drink poison or, you know, do something silly and say, well, I can't be hurt because I'm the child of God. I thought that that's, that was kind of the interpretation that I had. Is am I? I guess I'm totally off base. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's not off base entirely, but this is a deeper meaning to that. Uh, yes, we get tempted in many subtle ways we don't even realize, and that's certainly one of them. That we are sick is a temptation. You know, if you see it that way, and God leadeth us, us not into temptation, but delivers us from sin, disease, and death. And I was thinking we can use that right now for what's going on. Things to be seem to be ramping up amongst Russians and the Ukraines. When you're tempted to feel war, you can realize that the nation's real nature is superior to such phases of the dream of mortality. This is a dream of mortality. I'm going to... Um, I want you all, really, you all should be studying now Martha Wilcox's chapter on war. It's, it's a fairly long chapter. I can't, I'm just going to read a few things from it right now. But it's very important that we get a right sense of what's going on, make sure we impersonalize it, um, not get into the fray of the whole thing we're all tempted to do. So uh, I think, go ahead, please, Lawrence. Yeah, I think maybe Eddie, all the writers are saying that <clears throat> it's it's a temptation that we submit to if we say that any imperfection or any discord is real. In in other words, if we have maintain the Christ mind, we have to know also that that the Christ mind cannot be mesmerized. It cannot be done, and that's what you're saying. That always to focus on God as all. Therefore, we are not mesmerized. We cannot be mesmerized by what mortal sense is saying. And therefore, we stay true to the truth of God's allness and not submit to the errors that come. Thank you very much. That's it. You know, that um, watch or prayer we have at the end of all our watches, right? Mrs. Eddy says the one... (laughs) Most important watch to know that what men and and nations, governments cannot be hypnotized. That's what it always is. It's what it is. So we must stay dehypnotized. It's just like we've talked about when there are these horrible, so-called horrible storms going on and the news is 24-7 about them. Well, now you turn on the television, it's 24-7 about this. I don't know how helpful that is. I don't think it's helpful at all. So we need to know what's going on, yes, but we don't need to spend all our time looking at it and thinking and getting mesmerized or frightened or whatever else. We certainly don't need to believe that there is such a thing as an evil person or an evil nation or an evil anything. Thank you. Thank you. And also that it's not going on out there somewhere. There is really here. So here is the only place where we can meet it, is right here. And that's been um, something that I've been learning as I try to project my thought 
to there to where this situation. No, no, no. The, in fact, there has the word here in it. So I thought, <laughs> here really is, <laughs> it's really all here. Yes. There's no there. That's it. It's in our consciousness. What are we seeing and accepting to be true? And we have to hold this line. Um, Otherwise, our prayers are not useful. They, they are not useful. You can't be praying for one side or the other side. You know, it's so easy to get into that. Martha Wilcox says, war, according to the revelation of Christian science, is mortal mind or animal magnetism. And mortal mind or animal magnetism stands for all evil of whatever name or nature. It is the belief of life, substance, and intelligence in matter. The belief of minds many and powers many. And the more we as Christian scientists accept the suggestion that war is going on as a fact, the more we strengthen and perpetuate the belief of life and matter and the belief of minds many, and the more we are governed by mortal mind or animal magnetism instead of by the reality of being. She goes on to say what sort of what Florence was saying, you know, animal magnetism can be in any form. Um, it doesn't matter how great it seems to be. It is still nothing. We should not make the mistake of believing that the evils that confront us are great or small. In the demonstration of the one mind, we find that error is neither great nor small. Our textbook teaches us that all errors are illusions. And what is an illusion? An illusion is an unreal appearance. And this, you know, she's talking about World War II in this, but we certainly apply it to this, any situation. She says, this so-called war is purely the result of a universal mass mesmerism, an obsession. The so-called mortal mind's obsession that an increase of material good can be only had only by external or extraneous additions of good. In other words, the expansion of so-called human good is by accretion rather than by the unfoldment of spiritual ideas from within. And then this is what I love. I've written articles on it. But, but in Christian science, we understand that God made man and gave him presence and certainty and position. And man does not desire to get from somebody or from some other nation but draws from infinity. I love that. It's true about you. It's true about everybody. All this competition and wanting what others have. I don't have the time to even know what's behind these so-called things. I don't think any of us know because there's so much that goes on we don't know. So we just stick to the truth with a capital T. <clears throat> and anyway, that whole chapter we, we should all be studying it and working with the ideas in, in there. And yes, it's within ourselves. <clears throat> we must meet it there and find our peace. And in meeting it there for our own selves, we meet it for everyone everywhere. And we can declare that. <clears throat> and then this is also something very interesting from first edition that we listened to yesterday. It's on page 107 of first edition. May I'll have Gary read it. <clears throat> An evil and artful mind is all the Satan there is. And this is the fallen angel or abused capacity. Such a mind learning its control over other minds will take the reins into its teeth. And truth alone must take them out and guide it. As of old, this mind works its spell in some manner on all it would harm, because the barriers against evil influences from such a source are not understood by the world in general, and the door is not readily closed against them. To this end, metaphysics are important. Study mind more and matter less. For we must find refuge in soul to escape the error of the latter days. And mediumship and mesmerism, more than all else, contribute to a terrible future development of discord. 
we should strongly insist on the majesty of truth and its control over error and begin today denying right or reality to aught but God and the true idea, saying, Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity, and thus break up the reign of error, and let the world of harmony and truth reappear. That gets to more of the nitty-gritty of the whole thing, <laughs> but which we must not be ignorant to. So... I, I love it where Mrs. Eddy just shows it, what tells us what it is. You know, she once told Martha Wilcox, I think it was Martha Wilcox, one of her students who was just, you know, declaring truth and love, truth and love. She, she said, while your head, something to the effect, while your head is up in the clouds, what? Keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Holes. Yeah, your body is being shot full of holes, okay? <laughs> so, yes, we do declare the absolute statements of truth, but we must be wise and know what's happening and what's going on or what seems to be. And we're going to get into more of this because this definitely goes with our subject, Christ Jesus. What we have been given from him is just, well, beyond words. And uh, the answer to every problem including this one. Anyone else who wants to comment on that before? I think he, he also said once that as long as you believe in evil at all, you will have to continue with specific claims. So, you know, is, is God all or not? That's the, the thing. That's it. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, every mortal must grapple with his belief in evil and overcome it. That's a paraphrase. <laughs> Too, but science and health. So that's why we, you know, to get into this, that, and the next thing, mm -hmm. although it's so tempting, and it's tempting, it's been tempting all along. We, we're, we're building up our metaphysical muscles these last years <laughs> with our mm -hmm. pandemic. Now this, it's been one thing after the another. It's like, you know, like a horse that's leaping over um, fences. Sometimes they get higher and higher. Well, you get more and more trained to leap and and to go over it and to realize it's nothingness. doesn't matter what it's saying. It's still zero, zippo. And Mrs. Eddy says we must handle mediumship and mesmerism. In other words, let's pray for government leaders, government Yes leaders that they see the truth that they feel the truth that they be led to the truth that's the only answer mm -hmm. bullets do not fix problems right. understanding does and we have christian science so we are the example to the world of applying understanding to every situation that comes to our doorstep. And with the internet and news and all that stuff, everything around the world comes to our doorstep it quickly. Sure, it sure <laughs> does, yes. Mm -hmm. well. <clears throat> Thank you. I was reading um, Malpractice, How Does It Operate by Martha Wilcox. And there's just a few sentences I'd like to share, if I may. The, the um, explanation of evil is none other than overcoming it. There was never a moment when evil was real, and there never will be such a moment. Can you explain where 2 plus 2 equals 5 comes from? You can only explain something which is true. Use the truth continuously not just occasionally. And so I think that's what we are all doing right now. That's that was we, very helpful to me. Yes, thank thank you. you. There's another, Big Dal Young's aggressive mental suggestion is also excellent. It's in his collected writings. Um, we have so much, mm -hmm. so much unauthorized literature that please do not read or you'll be excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> Please oh don't defend yourself. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Please, please remain ignorant at all costs. <laughs> oh my! Well, thank God we have all this wonderful stuff, and I thank I thank God for 
Christ Jesus, Mary Baker Eddy, and all those early workers who have given us just an incredible amount to be working with now. And they stand with us now. You can feel it. You can feel that standing with us. Come on, guys. We can do it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. Stay with the truth. we got to overcome this. And we can, and we are, and we, we will. Um, before I get into anything more, uh, some of you have asked about Benjamin and his family, Carissa, his wife, whose family's from the Philippines, and many of you have very generously have given. Um, and we thank you all so much, and that little family is so grateful. Carissa and their family never, ever expected anything like this. And so I asked, because people have said, well, how are they doing? And he thanks us for asking, and he said they are recovering very well, thanks to all the love coming from the Plainfield Christian Science Church members. They are still in the process of fixing their homes and farms that were ruined. Chris's mom just went to the other island where family members were also affected. I was told they received help from some of the money the church sent as well. So we thank you. We thank you so much. They are extremely grateful. And Gary will read that at the service too, so people have an update. Um, and then it was interesting because Carrie sent me an, something from an old journal saying, occasionally it is asked, what does the Mother Church do for its members who have temporary needs? And in the Christian Science Sentinel, January 26, 1935, there was a description of some of the local work of the Almanor of the Mother Church, the charity fund of the Mother Church, which was instituted, instituted in 1908. Did anyone know about that? Mm -mm. No. no. <laughs> is contributed by the Boston Congregation of the Church through special collections taken at intervals, but perhaps twice a year, and through individual gifts. I never knew that. Mm. The president, precedent, president for taking these collections was established many years ago with Mrs. Eddy's approval. The purpose of the fund is to take care of the needy local members and needy pupils in the Sunday school of the Mother Church. And then it goes on about many branch churches follow this. Now, <clears throat> for as long as I know, our church, as far as I know, when it became independent, we have done this. We have looked out for people in the community. Sometimes we get letters from other churches asking. We don't give a huge amount, but, you know, $100 here or there. Or sometimes we have clothing uh, collections. People bring clothing that we've given to people in the community. Um, so this was really the first time that I know of we've announced something like this. Um, and now we are a worldwide church, so things have changed a lot. And we certainly expect all of you individually to give to your own charities and your own local communities as you, as God directs you to do, because it's Christian to do that, is it not? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The early Christians took care of each other. They surely did. They took care of each other, and we must too. It's another area. It is not the government's job to do this. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's what Shorty was reading in that book about the war, <clears throat> World War II, when they took the little vans. That's, the that's part of that committee, I think, she was talking oh. about. Oh, yeah, the white buses. Yeah. And it's simple to go back to think about that. But those white buses went places where nobody else could go because they knew the truth. Yeah, and they brought the food and the supplies and stuff that were donated. Oh, are they trying to speak? Oh, they might. Yeah, thank you. Were you trying to speak, Zary? Yes. Are you still there? We didn't know if you were trying to speak. Sorry. Well, can I interrupt and say something? Sure. sure. Well, since I've already interrupted, <laughs> uh, <laughs> since we're talking about support, um, I'd like to emphasize that it's really important to support our practitioners, not just when they're doing some specific work with us, but they're teaching us, you know, every day, every week. It should be like tithing for the church. Thank you. <laughs> well, yes, oh, absolutely, and thank you. You know, I'd like to add, I mean, on the comment, uh, I think Mary said this, but that uh, I've never heard this before, and, um, you know, this was done in 1908, and uh, Mary Baker Eddy approved it. Uh, 
So for those of us who grew up in the Christian science culture, um, this is really good, good uh, uh, example of how we can kind of open up our mind as to what does the Christian science church do? Because um, I know I'm speaking for myself, been trained, so to speak, as to what a Christian science church, or let's say branch church, does or does not do. And kind of carry that over because that's what I've lived with all my life, right? Yes. Um, but this is a good example of how, hey, there, there's more to it. Anyway. Thank you very much. No, very true. Sure. And, and you don't have to ask Boston for permission. No, thank goodness for that. They're not to interfere. Is, is she some... is trying to say okay. something. Sorry, yeah. you're trying to... Okay, well, we'll try to put you on speaker. Oh, if I can say one quick thing, I asked Benjamin also about the family. Okay, okay go ahead, Zary. I think we have you now. Okay, I'm really grateful for the support um, that you actually extended and uh, Florence from the church because um, you know that there has been a situation where I didn't get my mail and the government has made me pay back a big uh, bill and uh, which, uh, humanly speaking, seemed to be quite uh, daunting. So I am growing in my thought about supply, and I can only say that when people, uh, you know, not only give you beautiful words, but also the support, uh, this is so lovely. And uh, this reciprocal love is only what brings us forward. We're living here in uh, Germany, and uh, yesterday, a friend from uh, Beirut got in touch with me, and their uh, their pot, their mail was saying uh, their um, media was saying that uh, Putin was okay with what he was doing, and I got humanly rather disturbed about it because it wasn't this person who said it; it was a friend of hers. And so all day I have been saying, "What is the generosity of God? What do I give to this friend?" And we've got argument and I realized what when we give uh, unconditionally and we give as Jesus did this is what brings the ire of error because error does not want us to wake up and when we see the oneness this is when we have to you know pitch uh, stand up to you know back so to speak and this is what Martha Wilcox is dealing with thank you you're welcome thank you Zary Lawrence did you want to speak no, I think I, I'm feeling, I'm supporting the fact that, yes, we have, it's Christian to give. I mean, it's the thought behind the giving to me that matters. So if the giving is showing God's abundance for everyone, then that's fine. It's, it's really lifting the person up. It's not always that we just give, 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 give like that, but actually to give with a sense of no, God's abundance is for all of us, and maybe this is a demonstration of it. It helps people. It really brings people up. And I, I'm so glad to hear that Mrs. I know that Mrs. Eddie did do that herself. But also, uh, this is the first time I learned about the church uh, situation there. So Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And you will find different things, different uh, needs will come to you specifically, not to anybody else, but to you. And you have to decide, is, is this something you want to do or contribute to or not? And only God can tell you. It is, we've talked about that before, too. It's not just a matter of giving here, there, and everywhere. It's endless. It's, it will be endless, yes. But it's, it's, right. it's not direct. Okay. Yeah, and Jesus was an example for this. Because he, he didn't heal everybody, you know. That's right. There were some people who who weren't ready. And he also said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Which yeah. means don't waste what God has given you on people who aren't going to appreciate it. Also, I think, what is your motive for doing this? Is it to bless, is the, is the question. And I have friends who very freely tell me, oh, I've done this to give this to this charity. I've given that to that charity. Well, what is the motive behind that? And how good is it going to be for that charity if it isn't given through the Christ truth? 
Yes, the motive is always important. And the motive should always be, is it God-directed? Yeah. That's the only way. It, is it, does God want you to do it or not? Because only he knows. And if you are feeling that oneness with him, you will know the need to, and you will know what you need to do. That's the only way. That's the only ultimate motive. As we, a few weeks ago, we talked about this. Mrs. Eddy did not want to be known as a good person because she knew only the one is good. Only God is good. As, as Christ Jesus declared as well. So, yes, it's a matter of what God is telling you to do. And when you feel that oneness with the Father, you will know when when to give and perhaps when not to. So, And that's different from humanly wanting to bless. Because yeah. a lot of people get stuck there. <laughs> or humanly wanting credit for having... It, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah your, name, your name on a building or in a... <laughs> magazine or or something or something right. or something so did carol have some oh yeah, yeah carol i'm sorry oh, yeah i said that um when, when i asked benjamin about how his oh, family was doing as well he said that uh they not only lost their homes they lost their livelihood he said they're farmers yeah. and he said they their, their fields the crops had just started coming in they lost all of that and he said that they have animals that help them with their farming and he said they lost them as well yes so th this really was a good need and this is blessing them immensely yes yes and I, I know they'll never forget what's done and carissa i mean that she's not she's learning about christian science and to become a christian scientist but this is knowing us by our deeds not our words so and yes thank you <clears throat> All right, our subject, Christ Jesus, Lillian, the golden text. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am Christ Jesus. Thank you. And Louise on the forum wrote some beautiful things about, you know, the de declarations of I am. I won't read them all because you can read them. And they'll be in, I'm sure, in the highlights when they come out. And uh, I know Florence has spoken to it many times. What about it, Florence, about I am? <laughs> what are you declaring? I, you know, it's, I am only what God is, right? And God has always been. That's why the I am, before Abraham was, I am. It's something we, we must all have learned to know. What I am. What is it that I am? I am only what God is. It, Mrs. Eddie tells us in so many different ways. We are the manifestation, the the reflection, all these things, the witness, the representation, all of them. So this I am is big. I think there is there I read it says that the law is that I am and that is what we need all of us to learn. Why what is the I am that we are? And that helps me a lot in everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And that's why to be careful, you know, you blasphemy, right? When you say I am stupid or I am ugly or I am this or I am that. Who who I am? I am. I don't think so. You watch what you say and how you address yourself. It, it, we, you know, we're denying God. Uh, last week you talked about dishonoring God. Every time we accept any yeah. error, we are dishonoring him. We're saying oh. maybe you are... Uh, <laughs> Two tenths or something, but God is, you know, God is all, all, all at all times. So if we are the manifestation, then we are equally uh, as God is, only as God is. So, oh, I'm getting old. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm this. Watch. We have to watch what we say. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, watch, watch it. That. Peter V. Ross, you're always talking to yourself. Make sure you're saying <laughs> good things to Make yourself. Make sure you're saying not, the truth about yourself. Yeah, not tearing yourself down. Or others. Not abusing your capacity like that. Yeah. Think from first edition. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Don't want to malign it. No, <laughs> not at exactly. All. No. So I am, you know, yeah. I, am, I am intelligent because God is my mind. Mm -hmm. I am healthy because God is good. There can't be anything else. I am no. because God is principal. Good. Is that Ingrid? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, 
I, I it also I was reading the other day a great article and it was talking about how it it goes so much deep in English how to be is such a like a great of course the main verb but that it also is got gotten to be to mean anything you know uh, it was saying even uh, uh, saying I am an engineer. We are already putting something different there, you know, and or, or a lot of other things. And that the the only thing that we can really honor the to be or the I am is by saying I am a child of God. That Thank anything you. else, we are already diminishing who we are. Thank you. And yep. I just love that idea. Excellent. Thank you, Ingrid. That's so, so good. Because you never want to limit yourself. No. Mm. Or, or, or the, you know, all the human thing that goes with, or, or false belief or false responsibility that goes with, I am a mom, I am a dad, mm -hmm. I am a husband and a wife, all of that. Yeah, thank to you. be careful, you know, we're not going to deny that in this human sense of life, but to be careful with, with it when we say, you know, and the only truth, absolute truth is I am a child of God. Mm -hmm. I think it's the faith in that that helps people who can't, you know, read. I, I, I always say this. I say it because I, I'm seeing that it's the faith that they have in this when you're told that, you are God's image and likeness, and you just latch on to that. That's all. Then that's all you can be, which makes all the other things, you know, nothing really, because God is all. And I feel that is the faith in that that makes them healed. Yes. Thank you. And when someone has faith in that, it makes them want to learn more about who and what God is, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when you learn who and what God is, you begin to learn who you are. And then everything starts to come together. But you're right. That's, it has to start there. Mm -hmm. And like Gary said, that is, if you want to manipulate somebody, the worst, the, the thing that you do is just, you tell them that they can't do it. You know, <laughs> yeah. and to start with. Mm -hmm. And then, no good. And Christian yeah. science is the, as he says, it's like an open door. The, uh, the as you, spiritual idea of the Holy Ghost and the Christ, all those allowing you to be that expression. And so once anyone realizes that it's not them, but it's God that's working, they're just, they're free to be all that God made. And, and it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you, Craig. That is so true. That you know, they tell you 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 they that voice. If it's not the voice in your head, it's your somebody else telling you you're stupid, you can't do it, and to try to get you to prevent you from doing it for usually very sinister and selfish reasons. And what is that thing about manipulate and? Oh, uh, manipulate, dominate, and intimidate is the definition of witchcraft. Yes, witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Definition of witchcraft. And see, this is why you get this truth out because once the the people know what's true about them, they will rebel. Right. And many people have, um, maybe not even ever even reading a Bible, but they will, will rebel at the fact that people are calling them those names, whoever it is. Some people just sit meekly and take it, but much better to rebel against it, rise in rebellion against it, and find out who you truly are. Thank you, Craig. Very important. Don't let anyone ever, what was that? Nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> That's from a movie. Anyway, anyway, don't let anybody put you in the corner. So, no way. And then in that, also in that forum post, Ron mentions, and, and this was sort of the theme of the lesson, that um, before Abraham was, I am, and that's Christ Jesus talking, the Christ talking. So it's always been with us, and by time really has no relevance anyway because it, we're always in the eternal present now always and we're always being faced with certain things to challenge us 
to realize it's nothingness. They come in different faces, different experiences, but it's all the same error. And we've got to be like those horses, jump over the fence. And, and I, it reminds me about one point in the New Testament <clears throat> that whenever Jesus is quoted in the New Testament, whenever he says, refers to I, he never, there is not one sentence in the New Testament where he refers to himself as a human being. Mm-mm. He always is referring to the Christ. Whenever he says I, 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 I defy anybody to find a statement in the New Testament where he actually refers to the human person. Um, I mean, there may be, but I, I haven't found it yet. There, every time he says I, he's referring to the Christ. And that's yeah. the lesson. In everything that he demonstrated. It's beautiful because it's this that cannot be mesmerized. No matter what he saw, wherever he went, it, it could not be mesmerized. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I was reading, there's this book um, Carrie told me about. Florence has it now, too. It's called The Businessman of Serious. Oh. Syria, Syria, yes. And I believe it was written by Christian scientists. It's a story of Jesus. Um, but written more in a story-like manner. But one of the things it brought out, which I hadn't thought about, was, you know, when he whipped the money changers out of the temple, there were a whole lot more of them than there were of him. Mm -hmm. He had no doubt about what he was doing and his mission, and there was no question they were wrong, and he just did it. And they they ran, right? They listened. And that, to, to Florence's point, not mesmerized by the situation, seeing it as animal magnetism and with the authority of Christ casting it out. So, all right, now I want to get to the responsive reading and what Parthens wrote, but I'm going to circle around briefly to a couple other forum posts. One is Linda's about being offended in me, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And yes, and I, I looked up a commentary, and I love what they uh, said. It was, quote, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Here the word offended is the same word translated fall away, as in John 16, 1, loosely translated as abandoning the faith. One who is offended by Jesus is at risk of falling away from Jesus. And then uh, in our lesson, Mrs. Eddy uh, said that Christ Jesus, quote, came to rebuke rabbinical error and all sin, sickness, and death, and to point the way of truth and life. So that's his, what he came to do. But um, I was doing my re, uh, daily reading, and I happened to be in the end of the chapter, Mark, the last chapter, Mark, and there's not that many citations. And he comes and he appears before the 11, and he it says that he... They were sitting there eating, and he upbraided, uh, upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was arisen. Then you go down five more verses. And so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. It just really made me think, because... He didn't come and say, oh, guys, I really, you know, you can do it. And let's, <laughs> you know, I just you. love you, and I'm going to miss you, and I'm going to go, and it, it all's wonderful. <laughs> he just, woo, ripped right through there, yeah. told them they were hard, you know, just woo. And then, then, you know, and then he gave them, told them to go heal and spread the and preach to the world and to every creature. <laughs> and I just thought that was really beautiful because if anyone who has experienced a correction or rebuke, they realize how it, invigorates and clears your thought and gets you ready for work and energizes you. And that was what they needed because they were <laughs> up against a lot of opposition when he... Thank so. you. Thank you. And, and I loved Jasmine. She wrote some uh, definitions, too, to hit, mm. thrust, or strike against, uh-huh. offend. That was early 14th century. Um, and then to disobey or to sin against. Excuse me. The first was Latin, to hit, thrust, or strike against by early 14th century to disobey, to disobey or sin against, and then rebuke all French by 15th century, a reproof for a fault or wrong, a direct reprimand, and then modern usage, a verbal smackdown. <laughs> 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 so, 
and I'm I'm very grateful because last last week I had to kind of rake the coals and go over things because lack of testifying, lack of people putting God first in their uh, doing work for God, whether it was writing lessons or other things. And I, I got two really beautiful emails, full plated apologies. And better than even the apology was the healing that followed. They're accepting the rebuke. One of them had a friend who was listening to it and it began to change her life. Another one um, had just been healed by doing this work for God. It heals. It's healing. It must be treated with the greatest regard and respect. Um, it's a privilege to do this work, anyone who does it. So I was so grateful for that. And I hope that they will turn their emails into some kind of testimonies because they were truly, truly beautiful and heartfelt. And, and I just want to repeat one thing, because what, what Linda was talking about, the Jesus rebuking his disciples <laughs> just before he ascended, he never personalized anything. He never spoke to a person whenever he, whatever he said. He was addressing thought, a state of thought. And this state of thought that he was addressing was a state of thought that needed to be lifted up it needed to be corrected for their sake for them to be able to do what god had for them to do yeah. if he hadn't corrected it the way he did they wouldn't have been able to go off and do what god had for them to do so when when we or anybody rebukes it's the rebuke of a state of thought yes and and the whole point of it is to heal and to uplift and if you take it, you will be blessed beyond measure. And if someone in your presence need it, needs it, then give it for their sake. Never be afraid to rebuke a state of thought that is an offense to God. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing that point. Uh, it's been so great to know uh, what Christian science teaches about that when pre science and health says error is not person, place, or thing. Wow. That yes. goes so well exactly. with the great point you got. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, it is. And, and there's just great blessing in doing it. So, so and also, but just quickly I lost Jeremy now we're coming to the end and there's still a lot more I have to say about the transfiguration which is so beautiful um, Jeremy did write about that but also uh, Carrie sent me a beautiful article about it as well the mountain experience by Carrie Maynard in an old journal 1914 <clears throat> but when she one thing she brings out which I had not really noticed that <clears throat> was it's in the lesson as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered. And just the purifying, rarefying, what, what prayer does for you, you know, uh, and, and you know when you see a person who's in that prayerful state, their faces shine, don't they? Whoever it is, their faces shine. And um, his face really shone because of the state of thought he was in. I think I've told this before, but I'll, I'll never forget at the reading room once when we, we, Mrs. Evans was accused of teaching class, but we were in there praying and working and watching, and we were all once doing a watch for the city of Plainfield, I think, <clears throat> and we were all praying, and I happened to open up my eyes during it and was looking around, and most everybody, their faces were all scrunched up, and you know they were all really grinding away. But Mrs. Evans had this most beatific look on her face, which really made an impression on me, because isn't that how it should be? Um, you know, she, she you could just tell she was communing with the Father. So I just think that's beautiful. Um, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And, and, and did, did his look actually change? Did anything about him actually change? No. No. His state of thought was so uplifted that it affected everybody who saw him. Yes, yes. And we should, we should remember that when our state of thought 
is uplifted to God. It's going to change everybody around us. Except, but Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> how did that happen? Well, that's, you know, animal magnetism. When the, when the Christ is being taught, it can sometimes do that to some people, put them to sleep. So, now, the responsive reading, which, which Parthen spoke to, which is about the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Logos. And to examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Um, he, he just goes into the great importance of living this truth, seeking it with your whole heart, the Word of God. Because if you are... He, if you're doing this, he, he goes into today, humankind is bombarded with commands and mandates, especially from the world of medicine, fear instilling demands that are falsely given exaggerated life or death significance, when in reality they have no significance whatsoever, except to those too fearful to stand upright, in whom the promises of God do not abide. Wow. Yep. So when you're grounded in the word, this other stuff, as we've talked about, you will not be mesmerized. When you're grounded in the word of Christ, in Christ, you will not be mesmerized by what everyone else is talking about and saying, whether it is war or pandemic or whatever else. It was an extremely important point that he gets into um, and one we must take to heart and we must seek the word, he said, with our whole heart, mind and soul. All right. Now we will end with something that was on the carousel. And this is the article entitled, Unto Us a Child is Born, from Essays and Other Footprints by Mary Baker Eddy. The existence of Jesus was identical with truth and the life that is God. He demonstrated spirit free from matter and the divine soul, the substance of man, and body, but its accompanying shadow. He knew that even as good and evil are opposites, so are the spiritual and material sense of things opposites. To understand this great fact in metaphysics, it is necessary to be born again, born of the spirit and not of the flesh. And this was the birth referred to in those words of the prophet Isaiah, quote, For unto us a child is born, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful." End quote. Great epochs begin with the birth of new ideas, the development of an unseen principle, unseen only to the material senses. When we enlarge our idea of God, it becomes more divine and less human. And this more spiritual conception of being has birth in higher individuality. The most notable period of the ages was that when a Galilean peasant uttered by the wayside and in humble homes to artless listeners, dull disciples, and to wondering ears his simple sense of truth, of how it healed the sick, saved the sinner, and robbed the grave of its victory. He trusted those words to the providence of God, but in no fact seems the man of Galilee greater than his serene, in his serene sense of the immortality of those words. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. What a calm confidence was that was that in the superior permanence of mind over matter. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.